Father, we just thank you that we can come and be with you in, in your presence, Lord. Father, I just want to pray for Gary right now, Father, that you would just be with him. Help him. Help Mary. Pray that you can bring healing and health to his body, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, when the, uh, Jesus was on the cross, he looked to the thief. And this is what he said. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I heard a story of two Christians who lived very healthy lives. And when they died, they went to heaven, and they walked around just marveling in paradise. And um, one of the men turned to the other and said, Wow, I, I never imagined this was or even would be like this. And the other one was like, I know, if I had known all that, I could have eaten all that oat bread 10 years ago. He says, he want to go ahead and go, you know. And um, I'll be honest with you, I told my wife uh, like a few weeks ago, I'm like, I, I, I have no problem. If I, I would, if I went right now, I'd be just happy as can be. You know what I mean? And she was like, I don't go right now. I'm like, I do. I, I want to go when I, I go right now this time. I would. I'd be, I mean, as a hot just long to go. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to go. I just want to, you know, I love my life here. I love the life the Lord has given me. But, oh, this ain't nothing compared to what it's going to be like with Him. And I just want to go. If he came and took me right now, it would be just wonderful. Uh, I mean, that's how I look at it, you know. And uh, there's no fear in that. There's just safety, you know. There's confidence. Or just it, it's just because love casts out that fear, brother. It casts out that fear. But Jesus told him. He said, "Assuredly, no one in my message. But assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise." Now. Back then, the word paradise was a Persian word which meant a walled garden. And when a Persian king wished to do one of his subjects a very special honor, what he would do was make him a companion in his garden. And he, he was, in other words, he was chosen to walk around in the royal garden with the king. Okay, that's what that meant. So when Jesus said this to him, it was more than um, immortality that Jesus was talking about. What he was saying is he's like, you're going to have an honored place with me as a companion in the Garden of Heaven. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? You will be with me. So in Luke 22, 43, Jesus said this, and we talked about this when we had communion. But he said, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So I believe God gave us three wonderful truths about his salvation. And uh, the truth is that he's going to bring us to heaven here to claim our inheritance. First, God has come to meet us where we are. He's come to meet us where we are. It wasn't by accident, Brother Trent, that those two men were placed beside Jesus on the cross. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by accident that Jesus was crucified between them feet. It wasn't by accident. It was the divine plan of God. God arranged for Jesus to meet with them two men. Now Mark 15, 25 to 28 said it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of Jews, with whom they also crucified two robbers, one at his right and another at his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered 
with the transgressors. No accident. You know, perhaps this was the first time, Brother Trent, that um, these men had experienced the presence of God. There's Jesus, right? Well, God, right? Well, they're in his presence. Um, but when they needed him most, he was there. That's the thing. When them two robbers needed him most, he was right there with them. Right in the midst of them, reaching out to them. Even while he was on the cross, reaching out to them. One thief died on the cross, took advantage of that closeness, and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. God also spoke through the prophet Isaiah that said, I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. You know, I think in, in the routine of life and in the crisis of life, God is near us. I think He's near us all the time. But, you know, it seems like when things are going, when we have crisis, He is near us. He's our hope in the midst of things. He's our hope in the midst of all that happens in our life. He is the hope. God places Himself there so we may experience His salvation, His comfort, His love, and His passion. And when I say salvation, I'm not talking about just, uh, oh, I, I got saved from the Lord of Heaven. That's not what I'm speaking of. What I'm speaking of is, I mean, His salvation is working every day. He saved me from myself every day. <clears throat> I was talking to um, Pastor Dirk, and he, you know, he was talking to me about the, the enemy and stuff like that. And I was like, he's not my worst enemy. The devil's not my worst enemy. And he's like, what do you mean, the devil? I'm like, here he's my worst enemy. But God saved me from duty every day. His salvation is constantly at work. So God is merely saying, God accepts us just like we are. Just as we are. He so said, remember the sinners, the tax collector. God accepts us just like, He loves us enough not to leave us that way, but He accepts us just as we are. The thief hanging on the cross was still a thief. When Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, he was still a thief. He's still a thief when he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He wasn't a redeemed man then when he said that. He was a thief. But when Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, the thief part was gone. It was gone. He said Jesus accepted him right where he was. Right where he was. Hanging on the cross of thee. Isaiah 55, 6 and uh, the first part of 7 said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Now, I believe in the presence of God there's a transformation that takes place. What has been isn't what will always be. And I believe that in the presence of Jesus, a transformation took place in that thief. That thief seen This is the Son of God. Lord, remember me. You see, something took place in the presence of Jesus in that man's heart. Something took place. The despair and helplessness there have been plenty of times that I would just be so frustrated. I'd feel like life is just burdening down on me. And I'd just go and get in the presence of God and all of that just melts away. All of that just goes away. And I come out just a brand new guy. We die daily. There's transformation that takes place in His presence. The problems that confront us no longer become problems, but possibilities. The fear that grips us melts 
and fortitude in the presence of God. There's no fear anymore. And the filth of sin is washed away in the presence of God. I remember Mr. Raymond one time going, he's having a men's Bible study a couple years back, and I never had this happen to me the way it did. But I was just up here, I was praising the Lord. I mean, the presence of God was just so wonderful, and I mean, people started coming in. But I just felt so, I mean, it's like I seen how filthy I was. I mean, it's just I seen it. And I'm in the presence, but I just seen how unclean Gary is. But you know what? There was absolutely no shame in it. No shame. No shame whatsoever. It was like I could see how filthy I was, but I could see how wonderfully clean he had made me in his eyes. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. This is beautiful. I think one of the most freeing things is knowing that I don't measure up. That mm -hmm. he measured me up. He made me measure up. See, that takes away a lot of bondage. That takes away a lot of, I gotta be good enough, or I gotta do that. No, no, no. His goodness is what changes me. His goodness. This transformation takes place. The filth of sin is washed away in the presence of Jesus. It's just gone. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 says this, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now I'm going to say that some people have took this scripture and just use it as a battering ram against people. They took it and used it as a battering ram. I don't know. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkard, nor slanderer, or swindler will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you are. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our Lord. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. That is so good. Because here's Gary. Gary was a thief, greedy, drunkard, adulterer. You know, so, oh, I'm a, you know, the real meaning of adultery is anything you put before God. That's the real meaning of an adultery. I mean, we look at it as, but if we want to get technical about it, when Moses said that thou shalt not murder in that commandment, we like to think of that as getting a knife and killing somebody. But it was more than that. It was character assassination is considered murder. That was considered murder too. Where you speak bad of somebody. Murder with your words. See? So I believe that we're all um, washed, we're all sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote this, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all become new. All things have passed away. Behold, all become new. You know, when I first got saved, the that, um, Word of Faith movement was big. You remember that? Like uh, different ministers that are gone now to be with the Lord and stuff, but they had this, just confess it. If you confess it enough, it's going to happen. Remember that? Just don't say nothing negative. You know what I mean? Don't say a thing that I knew people who were sick as could be, but they wouldn't confess it. You know what I mean? They would, I knew a guy had cancer. He wouldn't confess it. Because he had listened to these teachings. You know, about the confess. You know, don't confess. So here's me. I'm like, oh, I can't say it. So you know what I mean? So all I do is confess. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I'm going out living like a heathen. But I'm confessing this, right? But then I got to study. And then, you know, when... People would go to Jesus and they would, you know, they'd be like, well, what is it? He'd be like, I'm blind. He never said it. People wouldn't say, I can't confess it. They'd say, I'm blind and Jesus would heal. And I've, I learned, Mr. Raymond, that faith does not deny fact. 
Faith changes fact. Faith don't deny it. It changes it. Now that's good stuff right there. But I would confess that I was a new creation. I go live like a devil. I mean, I'd be in church on Sunday confessing that, and I'd be chasing some women or whatever. You know what I mean? That's just who, it's what I did. But I kept confessing it, and I was like, well, it's good you know, But I remember the day, Brother Trent, when I was reading that, and I probably hadn't confessed it in years. And God said, that's finally come to pass in your life. It's finally come to pass. You know, a man once asked the lifeguard, how can you hear a person drowning when all these people are making these noise on the beach, talking, yelling, whistling? The lifeguard said this, I've been at this job for 20 years. I haven't let one person go in distress. My ears are turned towards those in distress that call for my help. Two thieves hung on the cross beside Jesus. One thief called on him in distress. And he got him. Isaiah 55, 67 says, Seek the Lord. Call upon him. Call upon him. The other thief, although he knew who Jesus was, never asked for salvation. He never asked for mercy. You know, as I was I was thinking, as I was reading this, I was thinking, how many of us live in a daily torment? How many people live in daily torment? How many people, you know, I talk to my buddy Dirk every day and some of the stories he tells me are just horrid. You know, he was telling me a story the other day about this girl and I'm I met her when I was over there, and you know we go walking at like four or five in the morning. And this girl, she she probably was ninety pounds, maybe seventeen or eighteen years old. Four or five in the morning, she'd be asleep on the curb outside the brothel. And I've been out all night waiting for them to let her back in the brothel. Her name was Priya, and uh. So he, he'd been over there and he, you know, went and seen her and visited her before she going to have plastic surgery. This is like heartbreaking. I can't imagine this torment. You know why she's having plastic surgery? Because the customer hasn't bought her in two weeks. She feels like she's not beautiful. So she's going to have plastic surgery to be beautiful so the customer will buy her. I can't imagine that kind of torment living in that. I, I can't imagine that. I just, I can't imagine that. Is it? I just can't imagine that. You know, Sometimes I think it's easy to get saved and just say, oh, we're going to heaven, you know. But salvation ain't something we get. It's something we possess. It's not something we get. It's something we possess. It's living inside us. Even right now, God's desire is to save us. Constantly be saved. To give me hope. The world will try to beat you up, but God's constantly putting hope in there. Constantly hope. Constantly hope. So, quick story, I'm going to finish. A young and devoted church elder once claimed to have a vision of Jesus. Now you imagine a guy coming to his pastor, oh, I have a vision of Jesus. You know that. People, people. His pastor decided to test his truthfulness in order that the next time the elder had a vision that he should ask Christ 
the pastor told him, he said, next time you have this vision, you make Christ. Ask him what my primary sin is. What my primary sin is. Well, some months later, the elder returned and the pastor asked if they had the vision. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had well, did you ask him? Oh, yeah. And that apprehensively, the pastor said, well, what did he say? And the elder said, he said, I don't remember. I don't remember. How many of you have heard of P.T. Barnum? Have you heard of him? Well, in the late 1800s, he was a very wealthy man in America. These were his last words. How were the receipts today at Madison Square Garden? Because he owned it. They were his last words. The actor John Barrymore, May 29, 1942, these were his last words. Die? I should say not, dear fella. I wouldn't allow such a thing. Those were his last words. Humphrey Bogart. I should never switch from scotch to martini. That was his last words. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Winston Churchill, who gave the commencement address, Never Give Up, died January 24, 1965. These were his last words. I'm bored with it all. That's his very last word. Karl Marx. Y'all know who he is? Communist. Yeah. These were his last words. I don't know what this communist is saying, but these were his last words. Go on, get out. That was his very last word. Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury, 1170. I'm ready to die for my Lord that in my blood the church may obtain liberty and peace. But there was another man in history whose last words tell us a great deal. He had a couple words after these words, but these were some of his last words. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. In February of 1941, Auschwitz, Poland, there was a Franz Siskin, if I can pronounce it, a French priest. Let me put it that way. I'm not good with the long words. A French priest. His name was Maximilian Kolbe. And he was put in that death camp for helping Jews escape the Nazis. Well, months went by and in desperation, an escape took place, and camp rule was enforced. Ten people would be rounded up randomly and herded into a cell where they would die of starvation and exposure as a lesson against future escape attempts. Names were called, and this Polish Jew named Fran Bishek Gasco Cape was called, and he cried out, I have a wife and children. And this priest Kobe stepped forward, and he said, I'll take his place. Kobe was marched into the cell with nine others. This was February. He finally died on August 14th in that cell. Now, this story was aired on the NBC News years ago. And this um, guy that he took his place at that time was 82. And while he was telling the story, you know, with tears running down his cheeks, a, a camera followed him around in his house. And they got to the backyard and there was this memorial set up with flowers, beautiful flowers around it. And then the inscription read, in memory of Maximilia Kobe, he died in my place. And that guy said, um, every year until he couldn't travel, he would go over there to Auschwitz to pay respect to that man who died in his place.
Here's what Jesus said, greater love has no one than this. And to lay down one's life for his friend. Amen. 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 Father, we just thank you. We praise you for your goodness. Father, we praise you that it is your goodness, your grace that leads us to repentance, Father. And Father, I just help, ask that you just help us to be a little more like you, Father. To die to ourselves, but to see others through the eyes of, of your eyes and the eyes of your Son, Father. We just love you and we pray you. In Jesus' name, amen.